wonen in Tilburg. <laughs> dus ik kom uh, een stukje uitzuiden. Wat verwacht je van vanavond? Ja, een hele interessante avond. Um, ik hoop dat ik er nog wat meer van kan op kan steken en uh, kan gebruiken in mijn lessen. Ik ben docent geschiedenis. Ik werk aan de Universiteit Leiden als universitair docent ethiek en geschiedenis van de filosofie. En wat verwacht u van vanavond? <coughs> nou, ik ben, vind het heel bijzonder. Ik, uh, ik heb me wel verdiept in het Aardman proces. Ik heb uh, het boek van Hanne Arendt gelezen. Ik kom uit de buurt van Zwolle, uit Hattem. En ik woon naar in Amsterdam. En uh, wat verwacht u van vanavond? Uh, nou, ik verwacht vooral veel te leren. Um, te kijken hoe het allemaal in zijn werking ging. Ja, ik ben gewoon nieuwsgierig ernaar. Is er nog een speciale reden waarom je hier vanavond bent? Um... Nou ja, gewoon interesse in, in het proces, in het algemeen. En, nou ja, het is natuurlijk heel bijzonder om iemand te horen spreken die het er zelf bij betrokken is geweest. Actually, I'm usually used to, 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 to speak standing, but this looks very attractive too. So I'll, 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 I'll start that way. And as it's high up, I, I, I can still see all of you. Uh, anyway, dag and uh, good evening to you all. It uh, really is a great pleasure to be here with you. And uh, uh, I try, I mean, you know, the Eichmann trial, there are so many aspects to this. Uh, legal points and uh, emotional points and historical points and ethical points. It's of course impossible to cover all that, but I imagine that many of you have heard about it and read about it. <laughs> so what I want to share with you are the sort of main points that are that that I really uh, I mean I, I never had routine cases all in my life as a state attorney and as a judge. But I think that the, the Eichmann case is a case, not a day passes without me being reminded of that case in this or that, that form. So I want to share with you uh, those special points, uh, emotionally and, and uh, rationally, that uh, really uh, are most in my memory and don't leave me alone. By the way, I'm very often asked whether I regard myself as one of the refugees of the Holocaust. Well, I can't say yes or no. I was born in a place called Halberstadt, a little town in Sachsen-Anhalt in Germany. But at the early age of two months, I decided to leave. To, don't take me so seriously. My father was in heavy industry, and he was the director general of a big factory in copper one of the biggest in Germany at the time. And that moved, when I, the year where I was born, moved to, to Berlin. So actually, I didn't know, I only knew, I grew up in Berlin at first. And uh, my father was one of the leading Zionists of uh, Germany at, as well. And also a little bit ironically, I went in Berlin to the Theodor Herzl School of Adolf Hitler Square. Is <laughs> also one of the ironies of fate. But anyway, I don't want to go into too many details of that in <coughs> my childhood, but uh, we were very lucky. We left Germany in 1938, two weeks before the Kristallnacht, you know, Kristallnacht, when all Jews, Jewish males were arrested. <coughs> And we then left for Holland. And uh, then we left Holland in 1940, one month before the German invasion of Holland. And then we went to Palestine th that month on the ship, the Patria, which was sunk on the next journey after that, with 250 people killed. So we were always sort of just one step ahead. And uh, uh, what really uh, even, even, even more uh, uh, gave me the shivers Uh, I, uh, as, as I say, in Germany I went to this Jewish school, the Zionist school, but in Holland I went to the Foschus Gymnasium in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, my best friend, uh, who was later the Dutch ambassador in the United Nations, uh, not Jewish, and he saw me later in the Eichmann trial, 20 years later, on television. And uh, then he called me, we reestablished contact, I invited him to Israel, and then he told me that after the war, 
he made some kind of research and he found out that of all the Jewish pupils in our school, that I am one of the very few who remained alive. And I then re re read in history books that between the outbreak of war in 39 and March 40, when we left Holland, Hitler had fixed seven times a date for the invasion of Holland, and every time he postponed it at the last minute. Once the astrologers had told him that the star situation was not favorable. Once they heard something on the BBC, thought the British were suspecting something. A number of times, weather conditions were bad. So seven times when we were still there, there was a precise date for the entry of the Germans into Holland, and it, and it was postponed at the last minute. And then the eighth time, when they moved in, we just left Holland. So everyone thought that my father had a sort of sixth sense as to when to detach himself. So then during the war, when the German army under General Rommel approached Palestine through Libya and, and Egypt, everyone came to my father and they said, where now? <laughs> so my father said, here is the last stop, here we won't budge. So then the Germans had to go back. Now, again, don't take me seriously, but this was accepted everywhere. That must, that must be, the, that could be the reason for the, uh, the, the, the German uh, withdrawal. Uh, just one more thing, when I spoke of Kristallnacht, why did we stay in Holland for a for length of time before we came to Palestine? Because all my uncles, my father's side and mother's side, were arrested in this crystal night in 38 and were... Uh, imprisoned in Dachau in Buchenwald and my father because of his connection with the Zionist movement he managed to get entry certificates for all of them but he didn't want to leave Holland until he had saved the whole family but they, therefore we stayed there therefore the family came to Palestine before we did and we were almost uh, caught that's what just one little thing that I about that which I also difficult for me to forget one of my uncles he was living in a little township in Germany. And uh, that was even worse because there all the Jews were known. In Berlin, when there were thousands, the Jews were arrested and didn't pay, people, not all people, people paid attention. But in this, these little places, there were 12 Jews. So everyone knew. So the Nazis, they came and they picked up my, among, they beat him up terribly. They destroyed his glasses. And he was thrown down the stairs. And then he was taken to a bus. And there they said, all right, we are going now to Dachau. And of course, we are not going to pay for you swine for the journey. So you have to pay for the bus. And then so he, they, they came, he, came to, he came to Dachau. And they took everything he had with him. With him, they took it away. And then they I said he should take his, there was a golden ring. They said, take it off. He said, but that's my wedding ring, and I never take it off, it doesn't come off. So a Nazi came with an axe, and he said he's going to cut off the finger if he doesn't take off the ring. Well, then my uncle managed to take it off. I'm already telling you about the date of what happened there. And then next morning, my aunt, who was staying behind, received a notice that she should come to Gestapo headquarters. At first she thought maybe to, cut, to, to, to run away or, 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 or hide, but that wouldn't have mattered, wouldn't have mentioned, mattered at all because uh, she, she couldn't escape. Also she wanted to know what happened to her husband. So she went to the Gestapo and there was an official there who said, look, Mrs. Bach, your husband went to a labor camp and he went by bus and of course he had to pay for the journey, but he paid with a 20 mark uh, shine and it costs only 18 marks 80 so the one mark 20 we want to return to you I don't know why that shook me so much the fact that he was taken at all the way he was beaten up the way everything was taken away but then this one mark 20 he didn't know how to register that so that was something he felt he had to return which reminds me afterwards when we met this had this uh, investigation about Auschwitz there, 
hundreds of thousands of people, Jews came and were sent to the gas chambers, uh, many of them right away, some of them after a while. But there were some Jews who had been sentenced to prison, two months, three months, five months, for uh, income tax or for uh, traffic offenses or for any other minor offenses. So when they got there, there were the German officials there said, we cannot offend our, our courts, and therefore if these people were sent, sentenced to three months imprisonment, they, have to be, they, they kept them in a different camp. The, the innocent people were sent to the gas chambers right away. But, this, you know, it saved the lives of many of these people because they were kept in a special camp to first undergo the prison sentence that was sentenced by a Ger by the, by, by the German court and then only later to be sent uh, to the gas chamber. I mean, that was something very typical. Now, as to the, the main points that are st stuck in my memory, first of all, uh, I mean, I had no idea, we had no idea... I was at the time the deputy state attorney of Israel, and uh, we had uh, no idea that Eichmann, that anyone wanted to catch him, that the agents had taken care of him. What I knew, what we heard, the first time I heard about it was when our Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, in the Knesset, in our parliament, said, uh, I want to give, to, 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 uh, give the info, to inform you all that Adolf Eichmann the head of the Jewish department of the Gestapo, was responsible for the carrying out of the whole of the Holocaust, that he has been caught and will stand trial. That had an electrifying effect all over the country, and we were part of that when we heard it on the radio. Two days after Eichmann was brought to Israel, the Minister of Justice uh, called me and said, Mr. Bach, would, we want, would like you to be the legal advisor of the police bureau that was entrusted with carrying out the investigation against Eichmann. You know, a whole prison near Haifa was vacated for that, and uh, Eichmann was kept there, and about 30, 40 police officers, and I had, well, I, I agreed, of course, and I had my office there. At the time, I stayed in a hotel in Haifa, and every morning, I went to that prison. I also, at that time, was the only contact Eichmann had with the outside world until his lawyers came. But the moment I arrived, I, let, I informed him, I let him know that he ha if he had some formal problem or some technical problem, then he could come to me and I would discuss it. He could discuss it with me or talk, talk it over with. But that I was not prepared to talk to him about the alleged offenses with which he would be charged because then I would have to be a witness and I knew I would be one of the prosecutors in the trial. So at first I didn't meet him at all. But then I very often asked, so what was your first meeting? It something also I never forget. I was on that day sitting in my office and I was reading the autobiography of Rudolf Hess not Hess, the, the assistant of Hitler, but Hess, H-O-E-S-S, the commander of Auschwitz, who was hanged in Poland in 1948, 12 years before Eichmann was caught. And, uh, uh, but before he was executed, he wrote his autobiography. And I was reading that on that day. So I read a chapter where he described how they had very many days where they had to kill a thousand Jewish children a day. And he described how the children used to kneel down sometimes in order to be saved. And he wrote, when I, with my colleagues, had to push the children into the gas chamber, our knees, my knees were getting a bit wobbly sometimes. But then he added, but I afterwards always felt ashamed of this weakness of mine after I talked to Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann. That was his rank in the SS. He says, because Eichmann told me that it's, 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 it's especially the children that have to be killed first. He says, because where is the logic that you kill a generation of older people and you leave alive 
a generation of possible avengers who can afterwards create that race again. Well, maybe there's some kind of silly logic in that, but ten minutes after I read that, a policeman came in and said, Mr. Bach, Adolf Eichmann wants to see you. So I must tell you, when I just had read that about the children, about the necessity to kill children first, and I heard his steps outside, and he was sitting opposite me, a yard away, like you're sitting here now in front of me, it was not so easy to keep a poker face at that particular moment. Eichmann wanted to discuss with me on that day the question of his legal representation and whether the Israeli authorities would agree that Dr. Savatius, whom his, 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 his wife and the family had picked as the most proper person to represent him, whether we would agree the Israeli authorities would make it possible for this German, who was, after all, one of the leading defense counsels in the Nuremberg trials and uh, one of the greatest experts in Nazi matters. So I, we, I, I explained to him there's no difficulty and we would certainly permit that and the man would come and if his family picked him, then also most probably they understood that he was the best defense counsel. I mean, that was happening on that day. Another thing I'll never forget is the difficulty, which was rather surprising at first, of finding witnesses in, in, in Israel. You know, many survivors, we had lists of survivors, you know, from all kinds of authorities, and we, but many of them did not want to talk. They came to us and they said, you know, for years we were kept, we have kept silence. We didn't talk it over with our children. We didn't mention it anymore. We tried to forget about it. We tried to push it away. We don't want to be reminded all the time. So, so I, I said, yes, but it's your duty to us history, to us justice, to us the Jewish people to tell us what you know. They said, well, some said yes, some said no. And <coughs> some people uh, said that, uh, uh, that I remember someone saying yes, but I am the only survivor of my little township in Poland. And uh, uh, what happened to me is not less important than what happened to other families. So if you call me as a witness, then I'll talk, but then I'll talk for four or five days. You won't be able to keep me quiet. And of course, something we didn't want the trial to take too long, so we sometimes even prepared not to call uh, witnesses like that. But anyway, uh, I mean, there were three of us who handled the case against Eichmann factually and Cross, uh, examining all the witnesses and arguing in court. That was the then Attorney General, Mr. Hausner. I was number two. I was the Deputy State Attorney. And then the District Attorney of Tel Aviv, Mr. Baor, with the three of us, divided up all, all the, 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 the uh, uh, countries of Europe and the various topics. And we brought all the uh, questions, all the witnesses. There was an idea that the case should be, not be too long and therefore it's not necessary perhaps to bring too many witnesses. I insisted that there should be a live witness for every country. Because, you know, when you read uh, uh, sort of written things, just uh, 100,000 here, 200,000 there, of course it's, these are the more important documents, but in order to show what really happened, to show the atmosphere, it was necessary to also bring witnesses uh, in, 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 and, and to show the, the, the atmosphere uh, around that. That connection, I want to tell you, we also decided to show a documentary film in the trial. And uh, we didn't want it to do to, too long, but we thought about 45 minutes to show a film in the courtroom. And I was asked by my colleagues to look at all the, for two day, three days and three nights, I looked at all the documentary films that existed at the time, from Russia and Poland and Czechoslovakia and America and England and Germany and so on. And I, I, I picked uh, uh, these uh, as about uh, 45 uh, minutes. And then, out of fairness to the accused, before we showed that to the court, to the judges, we wanted the, the accused and his lawyers to uh, see that. To, maybe they wanted to object to authenticity or something like that. So, uh, the, without the judges, the evening before we showed it to the judges, we had the 
prison, the Eichmann brought into the courtroom after, uh, during the trial and with his lawyers, and we showed that film. Now, I knew the film, so I didn't look so much at the film. I looked at Eichmann. I wanted to see how he would react to seeing, you know, the pictures of Auschwitz and the, the corpses in Bergen-Belsen and all these terrifying things. Now, he looked com was completely stoical. Didn't, there was no, nothing, no impression. But then suddenly he spoke in a very excited manner to the warden next to him. So when it was over, I called that warden and I said, tell me, uh, why was he suddenly so excited? He said, well, he said that he had been promised that he would never be taken into the courtroom unless he wears his dark blue suit. And here they're taking him out in his gray pullover. And that he, they shouldn't promise something like that if they can't keep it. And he has to protest most violently that they're taking him out in his gray suit and not his blue suit. That was the only thing that worried him. Also, that connection I would, would, would be interested to see your reaction. Amongst other things, you know, there was a Westerbork was the place in Holland where all the Jewish people, you know, were, were collected and from there they were sent to the east to, to the death camps. So we had a film that someone took also from Westerbog. But there, well, people still look normally dressed. There were some children who smiled. Some had, had, had toys in their, in their arms. The people were still ordinarily dressed. And you could see how they were sent into the, into the, into the train. Uh, the witness had then called. There was always two days during the week, on this Monday and Thursday, when it was decided who would be sent to the East. And all the people were waiting for these two days with trepidation, knowing that a list of people would be sent to their death and who would be there and who would, would, would not be there. But the, as I said, children still look, people still look more or less normal. So uh, when uh, I, I, I showed that to my colleagues, they said, look, this is a relatively short film. And with this part just doesn't look so very shocking. People look so nicely dressed and children are smiling and, 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 and have toys. And I had the impression that there was a little bit of a suspicion that I put in Westerbork because of my experience in the past as a Dutchman when I was, went to the Foschitz Gymnasium in, in, in Amsterdam, that because of that, I put in the part about Holland. But that's not, that wasn't the fact. That wasn't the reason. My impression was that, you know, when you show things like Auschwitz, the gas chambers, and when you put things like a, 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 the corpses in Bergen-Belsen, the thousands of them lying there. This is such a hell, such an inferno, that the ordinary person cannot identify with that. And you cannot put yourself in that place. But when you see this little piece about Westerbog, and you see people still dressed normally and still behaving more or less normally, there the ordinary person would say, there but for the grace of God goes you. That could happen to you because you could put yourself in the place of these people. And especially we show in the film, what happened afterwards in Auschwitz and then Treblinka and in Majdanek and in, in, in Bergen-Belsen. But this little thing I thought was important. My, my colleagues uh, uh, agreed with me on that. Another thing that I found, found it also difficult, to, to, impossible to forget. There was, as I said, a police officer for every country in Europe and for every topic. And my instructions were that they, they went through millions of documents. And uh, that they, every, whenever they came to a, 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 a document which might be relevant to the trial, they should bring it to me and I would decide what comes in as part of the prosecution case and uh, uh, what does not. So sometimes, quite a number of times, there were some attempts to save one Jewish person or one Jewish family and with, for very special reasons. And so they brought me these letters that were sent to Eichmann. But these were all in chronological order. So until I got the reply of Eichmann, it took a few days until they brought me the reply. So I had, I had dreams at night that sometimes one Jewish person or one Jewish family might be saved. But whenever it came to Eichmann, 
without a single exception, the answer was fatal. I don't want to be too technical. I just give you some examples. One day, a, a, a telegram was given, shown to me, a German general from France, the commander of Paris, had written to Eichmann that there was a Jewish professor called Professor Weiss, an expert, expert in radar. And this man had made many inventions and quite a number of patents. And the, it was important for the German army to examine him together with the results of investigations by German scientists. And that was important. And therefore, he, the general, insists that this man and his wife should not be deported to the East. Well, here I thought, under those circumstances, in the middle of the war, a German general says, one, one Jewish person, an expert on radar, important for the German army and for the war, therefore he cannot refuse. Well, after a few days, the answer of Eichmann, for reasons of principle, I cannot possibly agree. A few days later, a notice, the, the German general had called Eichmann by phone and had said, uh, and, and how dare you countermand my orders. This is, a, I'm, I'm a general of the army, a general of the Wehrmacht. And the answer of Eichmann, and I am an Obersturmbannführer of the SS and I don't care what rank you have uh, in the army. A few days later, Eichmann writes to this general, I have examined the matter further and I found out that a, uh, the patents of the Jewish professor Weiss have already been taken over by the German army. Therefore, I see no reason even for one more day to postpone the deportation of that Jew. And then a notice that he and his wife had been taken away uh, I, uh, and sent to the, to the east and, and, and uh, killed there. Uh, I just want to tell you, afterwards, as I said, I mean, all Western Europe and Hungary, I mean, the places where Eichmann acted personally, I handled those in court as well. And uh, in France was part of it. And so I, I was the one who introduced these documents about Weiss to the court. Two days later, my secretary came to me and said, there's a young lady outside wants to see you. I said, who's that? What's her name? Alisa Weiss, don't know her. Anyway, she came in and she said, I am the daughter of that Professor Weiss. I was a baby when they took my parents away. My parents apparently saw that, that the SS were coming, so they sent me to neighbors. The neighbors kept me and sent me to America. And there I was sitting and I heard, I, I heard, I read that you put in these documents. Now, not only didn't I know my parents, I don't even have a picture what they looked like. Could you give me some, some advice how at least I can get a picture of my parents? All right, one thing. A few days after, a, a policeman responsible for Holland. He came to me and he showed me a letter uh, written by the fascist leader of the fascist party of Holland. And he wrote to Eichmann that there were, there were people, 10 or 12 Jews, members of the fascist party of Holland. And uh, this, this leader wrote to, to Eichmann uh, that it would be demoralizing for the whole of the fascist party if these loyal members of the party are sent away. And therefore, he insists that these people should not be <laughs> deported. In order to make it more attractive for Eichmann, he even wrote something which was not very appealing, but he wrote, it might even be important for you that these people should remain because they can do intelligence work inside the Jewish community and they can give you information about all the Jews in Amsterdam and in Hague and other places where they are, uh, where, where they are living. Now, uh, under all those circumstances, I thought, again, Eichmann would agree. But the answer of Eichmann, uh, question of principle, I cannot possibly agree. He added, if you think it would be demoralizing if these Jews from the fascist party are sent this week, all right, let's wait three or four weeks by then, people will have got used to such an extent that they won't care uh, anymore. That's just one thing. Then, also, one we cannot possibly forget. One day, the consul of uh, Italy in Lithuania wrote to Eichmann, there is a woman 
Mrs. Kotzi. She is Jewish and she uh, is an Italian now. And she, her parents lived in Lithuania. So she had just visited her parents in Lithuania and uh, they were caught by the German army and by SS. And the question is now, should she be sent to the to the death to the death to the uh, death, death chambers? And he added, "This woman is the widow of a high Italian officer, and this officer fell in the fighting, and he was too particularly courageous, and he out outdid whatever did he was, was more be than any other officer in the Italian army. All Italy speaks." about this man who had fallen fighting in the Italian army. Now, we insist, therefore, the Italian authorities is, insist that this woman should be given the chance to return to Italy. Now, again, I must tell you, I mean, after all, Italy, the ally of Germany in this war, and the, the officer who had fallen with great courage, and this widow and the Italian authorities demand that this woman should be given a chance to return. The answer of Eichmann, question of principle, cannot possibly agree to this, and this woman was sent uh, also to her death. I mean, just multiply that about a hundred times, I mean, from the point of view of tra traumatic things, these things somehow, of course, it was somehow more important to read about 300,000 or 700,000 Jews, but, you know, these things are kept in, in one's memory sometimes more than some more serious documents about uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, who were killed. Another moment, when Eichmann was questioned uh, in the, uh, by the police officers, uh, he was, when he was, he was an inmate in an Israeli prison and he was, f wanted to fight for his life and he was, a, but still he couldn't forgive one single Jew that had somehow was not killed. So as you know, most probably in Denmark, the Germans failed in 1943 when they wanted to send the Jews from Denmark to, to the death camps uh, in the east, somehow it leaked out and many Den De Danish people took some of their ne Jewish neighbors and by rowing boats sent them to, to Sweden. And therefore thousands of Jews were saved. And uh, so Eichmann, he, went, he, he described in the pr examination uh, what, what happened country after country. And then he came to Denmark and he says, they should have, uh, uh, by force, forced open the doors the night before that. And then all the Jews would have been arrested. But uh, somehow uh, it wasn't done by the SS. And he said the commander of the SS, a man called Werner Best, uh, I, I, I know I read about him. He was the commander in, in Denmark. In '43. my impression, I didn't, know, I didn't meet him, but my impression was, that for him in '43 to get for Germany all the cheese and the butter and the eggs was more important than killing every last Jew. And he described that, but he wasn't taken so much to heart. That was my impression. So Eichmann told the police, the Israeli police officer in his examination, look what kind of people there are. Take this man, Werner Best. He was in Berlin, there was, he so, he was so small. And then he comes to Copenhagen and macht mir Schwierigkeiten. He comes, goes to Copenhagen and makes difficulties for me. As if expecting the Israeli police officers to say, you poor man, everyone made it difficult for you to kill every last Jew. But I mean, I, I, all, all this, of course, was also very happy. And then in the trial, Eichmann was asked, uh, what do you think about this Holocaust? What's your opinion? He said, I think it's one of the worst crimes committed in history. So I was asked during the trial and also later very often by journalists and politicians and others whether I thought that Eichmann meant that seriously. From the point of view of the punishment that he deserved, that he would have got, that might have been of importance. So I said I was sure that this was mere lip service in order to save his life. So people asked me, why do you say that? I said, well, I could imagine even a man like that 
that he could change his mind between the end of the war, 1945, and 1961, when the trial took place. Sixteen years had passed. I, the, his eyes could be opened. He might have been convinced by someone. Also, as an accused, every doubt goes in his favor. So I wouldn't say that it's impossible, but, but here we had proof that in 1956, when he was already in the Argentine, he was visited by the Dutch fascist journalist Wilhelm Sassen. And Sassen, uh, he, he was asked by, the, by his family of, of Eichmann to take his life story. And the idea was that after his death, he could publish this as a sort of life insurance for his family. And uh, uh, the, then uh, when Eichmann was uh, caught by our agents, he sent these, gave these letters to, and all these uh, uh, documents to Life magazine. And there, the, the pages with Eichmann's corrections in his own handwriting, no doubt about the authenticity, that uh, were, were, were sent to us. <laughs> so we saw there Eichmann, amongst other things, he said to this Dutchman, he said, I know you come from Holland. I was in Amsterdam. I saw the trains leaving from Amsterdam to Auschwitz. Das was eine Prachtweis. It marvelous to watch that. And the Dutchman, Sassen, asked him, tell me, do you sometimes feel sorry for what you've done? He said, yes, I feel sorry for one thing, that I wasn't hard enough, that I wasn't tough enough, that I didn't fight these damn interventionists enough. And now you see the result, the creation of the state of Israel and the re-emergence of that state there and of the ra race there. So I said, if he said that in 1956, 11 years after the war, and now in 61, five years later, when he's fighting for his life, he suddenly speaks of the gravest crime in history, I think I am justified, it's, it's, it's an understatement, that, 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 that really uh, uh, there, there is no doubt uh, uh, about that, that this was, this, this was, this was not a true ex uh, expression of his feeling. Uh, I, of course, this, this question of whether he was just you know, an, an official taking, uh, carrying out orders, or whether there's more to it, and that, that was one of the main things that we tried to examine. And we could really see, maybe not at first, but during the time that he carried out this job, he became an absolute obsession with him. He came, became completely identified with this. He said to some of his friends, who testified to that, towards the end of the war, I know the war is lost, but I'm still going to win my war. And then he went to Auschwitz to get the death rate increased from 10,000 a day to 12,000 a day. When he, there was a, someone who suggested that every German soldier who is one quarter Jewish, one Jewish grandfather, one Jewish grandmother, they should, he should either be castrated or sent to a concentration camp. Eichmann proposed that and supported that. The one who objected was Keitel, the commander in chief of the German army, not out of humanitarian reasons, but because it would weaken the army. There were thousands of soldiers like that who had been fighting together all during the war, so he objected. Hitler supported Keitel, because here it was a question of... But, but Eichmann didn't care about that. When the German generals at the Eastern Front were clamoring for reinforcement and for ammunition, he managed to get priority for his death trains, knowing that he must have known that he was harming uh, uh, Germany's uh, 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 war effort. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, these things, as far as uh, Eichmann was concerned, but the main point was that we had proof that he even countermanded Hitler's orders when he thought that might mean the saving of a few Jews. Just give you an example. You, you, know, you remember that Hungary was in, on the side of the Germans and the Italians during the war. The leader of Hungary was Admiral Horthy. Now, uh, 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 Horthy, uh, at the end of 44, beginning of 45, he thought the war was lost. He wanted to make a separate peace with the West. So Hitler met him at the border and by threats and promises wanted to try to force him to continue. First of all, it was important for Germany that Hungary should continue uh, on his side. Also, there were half a million Jews. 
still living in Hungary, who had not yet been deported, and they wanted to achieve that. So Horty at first didn't agree, but then he made he agreed, but he made some condition. One condition was that the Germans should agree that 8,700 Jews from, a, from Budapest should be permitted to leave to a neutral country. Uh, Hitler agreed, again, not out of humanitarian reasons, but because he wanted Hungary to continue on his side. And also he wanted the half a million Jews to be able to deport those. Now, how, how do we and he agree to that? How do we know all this? The Germans, by the way, the German government was very cooperative. And they sent us all the documents of all the ministries of Germany and the SS and the army and every, every, and every other uh, the Nazi uh, organization. And uh, so they sent us also all the documentation from the German foreign ministry. And there we found a, a, a telegram sent by the German ambassador to Budapest to Ribbentrop. Uh, and there he described the agreement between Hitler and Horthy, including this question of the, this point of the 8,000 Jewish families. But then he added, I have, however, to inform you that the local representative of the SS, Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann, was very upset when he heard about the arrangement between the Führer and between Horthy, because he thinks that these Jewish, 8,000 Jewish families that might be important biological material, and they might from these neutral countries even come to Palestine and help to create that race again there. And therefore, Eichmann, when he heard about this, has given instructions to deport now the Jews from Budapest at such a speed that until the visas can be arranged for these neutral countries, no 8,000 Jews should remain in, 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 in Budapest. Now, I, I, I handled Hungary, and of course, I put in this do document with a great stress, because if there's one thing that showed that he was not just an, an obedient servant, he, uh, but, but someone who was obsessed with this idea of his own war, then, uh, of course, here there was a decision of Hitler himself. So he... Uh, he, he, he tried even to thwart that. Only that connection, I want to tell you, I don't know, we haven't got enough time to this, but you may, some, some of you may have read all about Hannah Arendt's book, you know, where she tried to say that somehow we, we bolster up his, the, 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 the figure of, of Eichmann, that he was really in a, in a, in a servant. But she had only strange ideas, but, but most people don't know that in her book, the hundreds of documents and facts which she described were completely false. Now, this, I, which I just mentioned to you, this telegram sent by Wesenmeyer, the German ambassador, to Rippentrop, she quotes that, she refers to that, and she says, the prosecutor, which was me, the prosecutor, in connection with Hungary, put a great stress on a telegram sent by Wesenmeyer to Rippentrop, and she adds, only because that telegram shows that Eichmann was not prepared to obey Himmler's orders when they were contrary to the decision of Hitler, of the Führer. And apparently the German, the Israeli prosecutors did not understand that for Eichmann, Hitler was a sort of semi-god. Now, it's true that for Eichmann, Hitler was a sort of semi-god, but that makes it worse. Himmler had nothing to do with that. It was a decision, clearly, from that document, a decision by the Führer together with Horthy. So the fact that he tried to even countermand Hitler's orders, <laughs> this semi-god of his, that, of course, made it even worse. I just, you know, sort of things that I cannot forget when I mentioned this question of Hungary. Usually Eichmann sat in Berlin, pulled the strings. But when the German army entered Hungary after this arrangement, uh, he, there, really, Himmler sent Eichmann to Hungary to see to it that there should be no mass escape or no uprising of the Jews in Hungary. So, again, Eichmann, uh, when he told us about this in, in, in his testimony, he was even proud of what he did. He said, the first thing I did 
when I when the first Jews from Hungary came to Auschwitz, my instructions were that before they were put into the gas chambers, they had to write postcards to their friends and their families. And Eichmann dictated what should be in these postcards. He dictated they should write, we are here in a wonderful excursion place called Waldsee. Uh, wonderful excursions, very light work only, but not a lot of room. So come as quickly as possible in order to get the rooms that are still free. Eichmann told us something we didn't know. He said, I even added, bring good shoes with you for the excursions so that the German army should be able to get the shoes when these people were sent into the gas chamber. I mean, he was still proud that he, in spite of all this, he couldn't resist telling us that. Now, when I put in this, the, these, the, these documents, and about in Hungary, we had more witnesses than anything else because Eichmann was there in person. Then I suddenly heard there was a man in Israel who had still such a postcard and was alive, a man called Ferdi. So I managed to get hold of him. I said, come immediately to Jerusalem. He came at 11 o'clock at night. I tell you this because I, I mean, I usually questioned all the witnesses very carefully before that. But uh, I never had more than three hours sleep all during the, the, this trial. So when uh, 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 this man arrived, I just asked him, show me the postcard, translate it to me from Hungarian into Hebrew, which he did. And then I said, all right, what happened to your family? Tell me when I call you tomorrow morning as a witness. So I heard the story for the first time, uh, what happened to his family. Next morning when I called him as a witness, he also came at the last minute, I had no chance to talk to him. So first I questioned him about the postcard, that I knew, he showed that. And then I said, tell me, so who, what happened to your family? He said, I had a wife and I had a son about 13 years old and I had a little daughter, two and a half years old. And we came there by train with hundreds of other people. We had no idea what Auschwitz meant or Birkenau. And we were out, we were put out of there. And, and then we were, he described the selection by an SS man. The wife to the left, the little girl, two and a half years old girl to the left. Then he was asked, what was your profession? I said, he said, I was an engineer in the army in Hungary. I said, well, to the right, they still wanted to use him. And then, how old is the boy? He said, 13 years old. So the SS man said, well, I have to discuss it with my colleague, with my commander. It took about two or three minutes, then he came back and he said to the boy, run after your mother. So the witness said, I looked and I thought, will my son find my wife? Because already there had been hundreds of people in between during these few minutes. And he said, I looked, I couldn't see my wife anymore. She was swallowed up in the crowd. I couldn't see my boy anymore. He was swallowed up in the crowd. But my little daughter, she had a little red coat. And that little red dot getting smaller and smaller, this is how my family disappeared from my life. Now, just my chance, our little daughter, Oli, was then two and a half years old, exactly. And I had bought her a red coat two weeks before that. And the day before that evidence, my wife had taken a picture of me and had shown me the picture of me and the little girl in her red coat. So when the witness said that, and, and I heard it for the first time, it sort of cut off my throat completely. I suddenly couldn't, couldn't utter a sound. The witness recovered, waited for the next question, the judges gave me a sign to continue. The television was on me, and I couldn't say. I started playing with my documents. Well, it took about two or three minutes, but that's also a moment, something I cannot, cannot possibly forget. I can tell you until today, I can be in a football stadium. I can be in a restaurant. I can be in the street. I suddenly feel my heart beating, and I turn around, and I see either a little boy or a little girl in a red coat, that is, is, my heart starts beating and, and I cannot uh, somehow uh, control that. I mean, that's also one of the things that I, that, uh, that always keep in my memory. Another thing, I mean, there were many cruel things in this trial. 
But you know, there was only one person, one witness, who was, uh, I think, the, on the only person I've ever come across in, the li in my life, also in other countries, who was already inside a gas chamber with the doors locked, who could tell the story. How come? He described how he and 200 other children were pushed in Auschwitz into the gas chamber. And he described how the doors were closed and how it was absolutely dark. And then he described how the children at first began to sing to give themselves courage. And when nothing happened at first, the children began to cry and to shout. And then the door opened. We had other evidence about that as well. What happened? A train load had arrived in Auschwitz with potatoes. And there were not enough SS men to unload the train. So the SS men in charge had the great idea, why not use some of the children before they are killed to help unload the train. So they opened the door and they put out, they pu pulled out 20 of the children who were next to the door, and he was one of those. Then they closed the door, the other 180 were killed right away. But these 20 had to help, and uh, then they were killed too. But he, the, the, the commander had said that he'd done some negligence during the work, and that he'd done some, neg some damage to one of, the, uh, one of the trucks there. And therefore, uh, he gave instructions that before he is killed with the next group after that, that he should be flogged in the camp by an SS officer. So he was sent to the camp and he was flogged. And the SS men who had to carry out the flogging took a liking to him and kept him as his Batman. And this is how he managed to, 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 re, to remain alive. He also described how he came into the gas chamber on that particular day. The children who could still work were still used for that. But the ones who were too little or too weak were sent right away to the gas chamber. Now, the Germans didn't want to question every child. So they put up a sort of... Uh, 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 Two, two vertical sticks and a horizontal one, and the children had to walk underneath that. And any child that didn't come up to a certain height was sent away right away to the gas chamber. Uh, and he was very little, and he was very weak. And it was clear to him and his elder brother, who, who was taller, that his little brother wouldn't make it. So he described how the brother took stones and put the stones in the, little sh in the shoes of his little brother, that he should be a bit taller. And he held him up. But the SS men apparently saw that. I'm not quite sure now whether he killed the brother right away or he sent him away, and the, he was sent to the gas chamber. Now, uh, uh, look, uh, I mean, there were many cruel things, but when that ended, uh, uh, the, the judges were a bit dazed, and they said, well, we, we, we have to make a quarter of an hour recess, and uh, then... Uh, I, if someone's interested, the picture was taken of me also at that, that moment, uh, which I think uh, showed the special influence we had that that was. And then I went to, to, uh, uh, to my chambers and suddenly the door burst open and the young defense counsel uh, of Eichmann burst into my room and burst into hysterical weeping. And I had to treat him in order to enable him to uh, continue with the, the, this uh, fight. Now, uh, I don't want to leave aside certain points of that, of course, of legal points that I was sure during the examination that that might be raised by the defense, and all those were, in fact, raised by the defense. It was, first of all, the question that, our, that he was charged under the law, 1950, uh, with, and the, 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 the argument was that this is a retroactive law. And uh, the offenses were committed in 1930, 1940. How can you charge someone with a of serious offense like that in a retroactive way? Now, that's not really a legal point. It's a question of justice. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand that if we do something now which is completely legal, and in half a year's time, retroactively, this is made illegal, then to charge us and to, to sentence us, certainly not to death, and that, that is, is something which looks, doesn't look just, but that doesn't refer, it's not a norm for this particular occasion. When we, set, we made this law, 
that anyone who murdered Jewish men, women and children could be put on trial now after the war, we didn't create a new norm, something which was illegal under German law, under any law, even under SS law. It was only that the Nazis put up a, a, a certain, a certain a, a, a condition under which if the, if the victim is Jewish, the people would not stand trial. But we didn't create the new norm that it was forbidden to murder men, innocent men, women and children. And uh, I mean, this same point was raised in the Nuremberg trial. It was raised in all the countries, in Holland and in France, where laws were passed after the war to enable Nazis to stand trial for these offenses. So that, 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 that certainly was not a serious argument. But there was something else which was raised by many people, also in, in written write, writing and, in, and orally. They said, Israel is a Jewish state. And uh, the Jews were the victims of these offenses to which you refer to. Now, justice does not only have to be done, justice has appeared to be done as well. And therefore, the fact that you here have judges who actually represent the victims, that they could judge someone who tried to do this to these victims, isn't, doesn't that look unjust? Now, uh, again, I mean, legally, there's really uh, nothing uh, uh, to this. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's, as I said, it's a question uh, uh, of justice. The whole idea of criminal law is that instead of people where someone in their family is murdered or where a burglary has been committed, that they take revenge privately and do private justice, uh, there is a country, there is a state, in, in every state, a court, of law representing a community that defends the interests of that community. And if there's an offense committed against that community, they judge the person responsible. Like I said during the trial, during at that time as well, if in Turkey someone is found and uh, there's a suspicion that he committed high treason against England, it's not a Turkish law that will judge, a Turkish judge that will judge him, but an English court if they manage to get hold of him. But there's some people, when I said that, yes, but here there were special emotions. I think, I mean, under these are international crimes. And as such, any court that can get hold of this man can, put, can charge him. But any judge who can listen to evidence like that without having any emotions, I think he's not fit to be a human being, he's not fit to be a judge. Of course, he has to be objective. He has to give the accused every possibility to defend himself. No one said that the Israeli court didn't do that. I mean, the whole of the procedure was, was like that. But therefore, there's, there's really no justification of that. When I say the judges did everything to, uh, to, uh, like, like they did in every other criminal case. Uh, I mean, also, we, I don't deserve any credit for this. But when with all these hundreds of thousands of documents which came to us, I sometimes came across some documents that I thought might be of importance for the defense. Then I sent those, uh, like uh, obeying orders and the oath of allegiance to the SS, etc. Then I sent that to Servatius, to the defense council. Two days later, when I, after I sent him a couple of that, uh, Servatius came to me and he said, you know, I showed that to Eichmann. Eichmann asked me, who gave you these documents? And he said, the uh, Israeli prosecutor. So he said, Eichmann almost fainted. <laughs> you know, that, uh, that, that here the Israeli prosecutor would give documents for the defense. That's something that he, he, he just uh, 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 couldn't understand. But in that connection of the victim, I won't, I'll never forget, one day a professor from one of the European countries, of universities, came to me, also made that argument during the investigation part, before the trial started, about the victim and so on. So before I could answer, he said, tell me, show me the indictment. I showed him the indictment, and he saw that in addition to persecuting Jews, Eichmann uh, was charged also, in his department, they had killed gypsies, they had killed Russian commissars, they had killed Poles, Polish citizens, Czech uh, citizens, Russian citizens, 
So this man asked me, tell me, why did you charge him with that? Why didn't you leave that to a Russian court, a Polish court, a Czech court? So I said, wait a minute, five minutes ago, you said that you thought that a country representing a, a certain community against uh, offenses had been committed should not have a right to judge this man. But you don't seem to have any difficulty with a Russian court, a Czech court, a Polish court. But when it comes to the court of a Jewish state, there you have these problems. Well, the man had the decency to blush. And he said, well, I really don't know why I made that distinction. I have to think about it. I'll call you. I've never heard from him again. You know? But this, this was, of course, very, very typical. And I want to tell you in that connection, I never forget the first moment of that trial when these judges came into the courtroom with the Israeli emblem behind them. And when that, when that man, whose only object in life had become to destroy this people, when he got up and stood to attention before a sovereign Israeli court, before a sovereign Israeli nation, I must tell you the, 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 the feeling to understand the importance of the creation of the State of Israel and the real meaning of that became suddenly clearer to us than at any moment that had preceded that, more than at any parade or any demonstration or any article. You know, that is something that I think we all felt the importance of, 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 of that particular, uh, uh, of, of that particular uh, occasion at this particular moment. I, just a, a few words about the results of this case. Young pe I was told by many uh, teachers who uh, 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 in Israel that lots of our young people in Israel did not want to hear about the Holocaust. Why? Uh, they said a young Israel they felt ashamed somehow. They said a young Israeli can understand that you can be hurt fighting, that you can be killed fighting, that you can lose a battle. He can understand that. But he cannot understand how hundreds of thousands and millions of people can let, let themselves be slaughtered without defending themselves, without uprising. And therefore, they didn't want to hear details about that. Now, that was not the main purpose of the prosecution. But at least we also wanted to, uh, to, to show that our young people there was no reason for this shame uh, the contrary. So uh, we uh, showed the, the court. We, uh, I mean, just like I showed you in, in connection with the postcards that Eichmann invented, there were, in addition to that, lots of really systematic systems under which the Nazis managed to mislead whether they were Jews or gypsies or Russian commissars, how people were misled until the last minute before they were killed, and then they were too weak, and then this was, this was really done really uh, uh, scientifically uh, to show that people could not, get, could, could not really come as risen. And then, like in the Warsaw Ghetto, when the Jew, thousands of Jews knew death was waiting for them, how they really, there was an uprising, and how they fought to the last man with terrific courage and really tremendous bravery, and how they were, many, thousands and thousands up to the last men were killed fighting against the Nazis. So therefore, there was <laughs> really no reason for that. And there was a development. Afterwards, the children wanted to visit the death camps. They Israeli, they, they wanted to, were interested in, 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 in literature, in Jewish history, of, uh, in, in Jewish countries in Europe, etc. That was a development. And then countries like Germany. Teachers there told me also. There were always teachers who wanted to show that in the schools, what happened in the, in the Holocaust. There were always state attorneys who wanted to bring cases against Nazis, especially those in the death camps. In, in, in Poland, uh, etc. And, uh, but they were never given budgets, they were never given encouragement. But then came the Eichmann trial, and that came suddenly into all the houses every evening for an hour, so they couldn't stand anymore between the teachers who wanted to bring this to school and these prosecutors who wanted to bring trials. Now, the teachers told me that before that, the parents who were Nazis they certainly didn't want the children to hear about it. But even the ones who were not Nazis, 
They didn't want the children to come home and ask, where were you? Why didn't you demonstrate? Why didn't you do anything about it? What did you do to criticize that? Why didn't you do that? So they preferred the children not to know. But then came, as I say, the Eichmann trial, and they couldn't withstand it anymore. This, the prosecutors the same. They should have perhaps brought cases like that before. But afterwards, the ones who were interested, they, all the big cases in Germany about Auschwitz and Majdanek and Treblinka and Belzec and Sobibor, all this was brought after the Eichmann trial. And now, with the German meticulousness, we have documents of German, German documents with German judges with all details of what happened in these, in these death camps, which is especially important if you consider the people who deny nowadays that this holy, holy, uh, Holocaust has in fact happened and try to, uh, to, to, to muddle up uh, the, the, the facts about that. So that also is of great importance. And then, of course, from an historic point of view, from the point of view of justice, as a deterrent, that people who have a possibility to do what Eichmann did, whether they are in Yugoslavia or in Africa or in South America or wherever, if they, they know now that if they give in to this and they carry out acts like that, then even after 15 years, they ca there's a danger for them to be uh, uh, caught and to be put on trial and then to be punished in the heaviest way which is possible under, in, a, in a democratic society. So that also is of great importance. And then I must tell you also, I mean, 50 years have passed. And the interest in the Eichmann trial seems to be growing all over the world, all over the world, from year to year. Uh, well, people sometimes explain they are, the, the Holocaust was mentioned in other trials, like the Nuremberg trial, but, uh, but always marginal, always only part of it. The whole, this, it was all the aspects that was really uh, mentioned, this was really shown only in this, uh, uh, this particular case. And therefore, uh, as I say, sometimes I am surprised. It's, uh, it's certainly in, in, in Germany now, they have decided that in all their provinces where they have parliaments, this, uh, the, the Holocaust is, will be, uh, a whole day will be devoted in their parliament about the Holocaust every year. And I've been invited in, num in a number of countries, of, of provinces, to appear in their in their uh, 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 parliaments and to to, uh, disc to to tell them what I I know uh, about the case. What is even perhaps even more uh, remarkable, in practically every place, they ask me to meet with young children, with young I mean 17, 18 years old in the schools. I was in Saarbrücken some time ago, and they, they asked me to meet with 400 children, 200 each time, and to tell them, they said, we want our children to know that things like that should never happen again. And that, that is something which is really of, of, of great importance. Then, you know, there was this, uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the case in the, where in Germany, uh, next to uh, Berlin, in the uh, where was the co the, co the, the the famous congress, the uh, 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 the the, the Wannsee conference in the villa in the villa Wannsee. Now I sh that uh, Hitler decided in forty one to kill all the Jews, but in, at first they didn't disclose it even to the German, not fully to the German ministries. But then Eichmann told us he and Heydrich decided that all the people there should now know that, uh, uh, that th about the Jewish uh, uh, the attempt to kill all the Jews. And therefore, they summoned to Wannsee all the director generals of all the various uh, ministries in order to, 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 to bring about a cooperation uh, of all of them. And Eichmann told us, he said, you know, we were a bit worried. Many of these director generals were jurists. So we thought if we tell them there's an intention to kill 11 million Jews in Europe, some white people, I said, but that's illegal. That's illegal under German law. How can you do that? That they would criticize that. He said, and then he, t he told us the evening passed, and except for some 
technical questions. No one said anything and no one criticized anything. So he said, I and Heydrich, afterwards, we drank a schnapps, we drank a brandy <laughs> to congratulate ourselves. And we went three times, we were sitting before a fireplace and we drank a, a, a brandy in, 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 in honor of that victory of, of ours. Uh, now, a few years ago, I was asked to speak on German television, and then afterwards, I was taken to the Wannsee, to the Villa Wannsee, and uh, with, some, with some professors who also deal with the Holocaust. And we were d drinking coffee, and we, we were uh, discussing things, and suddenly I saw we were sitting in front of a fireplace. So I said, tell me, is this the fireplace where Heydrich and Eichmann sat together and drank to their victory? I said, exactly. So I must admit that the, 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 the coffee did uh, stick in my uh, throat uh, somehow. Now, just, it was now 65 years recently of the, the end of the, about a few years ago, and uh, they had a special meeting in Wannsee, and they brought hundreds of people from all over Germany to hear what happened there. And they asked me not only, not only to make the main speech, but also to conduct the whole evening there. And I couldn't refrain myself. There was this, this fireplace was still there. So I told them the story of that fireplace. Now there were about 20 people sitting in front of this fireplace. You should see how they quickly <laughs> moved away and didn't want to be this, this. Finally, I mean, you know, there are so many things that one can, that, that, will be, that we use as evidence. But as I told you, something that had nothing to do directly with Eichmann, we didn't use that. So just finally, I, w I w want to tell you about uh, 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 certain things that, you know, th which, which somehow depress me and uh, influence me, not less than, let's say, dis dis descriptions of this. You know that before they had the gas chambers, there were these gas vans where thousands of men, women, and children, Jews, were put behind in these, ga in these vans, and the exhaust, instead of going the outside, went inside. And these people choked to their death uh, 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 gradually, and after 30, 40 kilometers, they, they were bodies and they were sent uh, into a cemetery, uh, thrown away into a mass uh, cemetery. So one day, when I looked at the documents, I suddenly saw a German official who wrote to his minister describing what happened in these gas vans. And then he wrote, out of humanitarian reasons, I want to make one suggestion. And that is that we have to protect our poor SS drivers from having to listen to the shrieks that are getting softer and softer until the people were dead. And therefore, I've invented a soundproof wall to put up behind the seat of the drivers with this part behind so that our poor drivers are not subjected to these screams getting softer and softer. Now, again, I must tell you, when I got this document and I started reading humanitarian reasons, you know, I thought something to be done for these poor men, women and children are behind. But no, the only thing that worried him was that the poor SS drivers should be protected from not having to, 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 to listen to these, to these shrieks. As I said, we did, that had nothing directly to do with Eichmann, therefore we didn't somehow uh, uh, use that. But they, uh, uh, and I told you also that the judges were very uh, strict with us. So just the, the, one final point I want to mention to you about, about how, how this what was in fact given effect to. When I told you we had, I insisted there should be witnesses for every country, in, in, as France was under my control, so I chose there for France the evidence of a professor, Professor Velaire. He was in the famous Drancy camp. That was a place where the Jewish children were taken after the parents had already been deported. And this man had described in the most moving way how the children 
were there and how they, 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 they reacted and were nicely dressed from well-to-do families and so on. And then when I called this witness, I asked him, who was Jacques Stern? So the judges immediately interrupted. They said, has that anything to do with Eichmann? If not, then we won't permit it. I said, give me the credit that I'll connect that. So I asked him, who was Jacques Stern? And she said, he said, there was one little boy who was particularly aristocratic. And he was so nicely dressed with a tie and with, a, 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 with a, a lovely sh a, a shoes, etc. And he didn't, he didn't laugh and he didn't cry and he didn't take part in, the, uh, in, in what happened with the others. And it, I asked him after a while, uh, where do you come from and who are your parents? He said, my father was a well-known lawyer and he, my mother was a well-known pianist. And I also slept next to him in, uh, in, 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 in the barracks. And then he described how this little boy had one clenched fist all the time. So he asked him during the night, tell me, he had took some courage with him. Then they said, tell me, what do you have in your fist? Why do you keep your fist closed? So he opened it and there was half a biscuit. And he said, I keep this for my mother when I find her, when I get to, to, to with her together again. And then he started to cry for the first time. It was clear he knew he wouldn't see his parents anymore. But his only, his, his only hope for the future was that he, for, that, that he kept this half a biscuit to show his wife. And then I asked this witness, tell me what uh, happened afterwards. And he said, well, next morning they took Jacques Stern and all the other boys in this, uh, this camp uh, away through the train to the east. And then I put in a telegram sent by Eichmann to his deputy in Drancy, where he said, Hoch erfreut, with great pleasure, I can inform you that children's transports can now move towards Auschwitz. And then a few weeks later, that man, the professor, was sent to Auschwitz. The first thing he said he did was to try to find out what happened to Jacques Stern and the other children, and it was clear that they all had died already. I just mentioned finally this. And therefore, when I say, the, it, the, I had many, I, I never had routine cases. There were lots of, of traumatic things, but in, 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 in my experience as a state attorney and judge, but the Eichmann trial is something that I am, in this way or that way, reminded of practically every day. But with all the negative part, the fact that I see this development all over the world, and especially in Germany, where I see that attempts are being done, and I think sincerely so, to see to it that children should know about this, that children should be taught about that, and that people should be shown that things like that should never happen again. And that is something which gives me some hope for the future. Thank you very much.